This video will showcase the differences between House of the Dragon Episode 9 and Fire and Blood, with a side-by-side -side comparison of how things played out in the book and show. We'll also include the book-only controversies surrounding what really happened at the Green Council after Viserys' death. The Dance of the Dragons is the flowery name bestowed upon the savage and bloody struggle for the Iron Throne of Westeros, fought between two rival branches of House Targaryen during the years 129 to 131 AC. To characterize the dark, turbulent, bloody doings of this period as a dance strikes us as grotesquely inappropriate. No doubt the phrase originated with some singer, the dying of the dragons would be altogether more fitting. But tradition, time, and Grand Maester Munkin have burnt the more poetic usage into the pages of history. So we must dance along with the rest. There were two principal claimants to the Iron Throne upon the death of King Viserys I Targaryen. His daughter Rhaenyra, the only surviving child of his first marriage, and Aegon, his eldest son by his second wife. Amidst the chaos and carnage brought on by their rivalry, other would-be kings would stake claims as well, strutting about like mummers on a stage for a fortnight, or a moon's turn, only to fall as swiftly as they had arisen. The dance split the Seven Kingdoms in two, as lords, knights, and small folk declared for one side or the other, and took up arms against one another. Even House Targaryen itself was divided, when the kith, kin, and children of each of the claimants became embroiled in the fighting. Over the two years of struggle, a terrible toll was taken on the great lords of Westeros, together with their bannermen, knights, and small folk. Whilst the dynasty survived, the end of the fighting saw Targaryen power much diminished, and the world's last dragons vastly reduced in number. The dance was a war unlike any other ever fought in the long history of the Seven Kingdoms. Though armies marched and met in savage battle, much of the slaughter took place on water, and especially in the air. As dragon fought dragon with tooth and claw and flame, it was a war marked by stealth, murder, and betrayal as well. A war fought in shadows and stairwells, council chambers and castle yards, with knives and lies and poison. Long simmering, the conflict burst into the open on the third day of the third moon of 129 AC, when the ailing, bedridden King Viserys I Targaryen closed his eyes for a nap in the Red Keep of King's Landing and died without waking. His body was discovered by a serving man at the hour of the bat, when it was the king's custom to take a cup of Hippocras. The servant ran to inform Queen Alicent, whose apartments were on the floor below the king's. Septon Eustace, writing on these events some years later, points out that the manservant delivered his dire tidings directly to the queen, and her alone, without raising a general alarm. Eustace does not believe this was wholly fortuitous. The king's death had been anticipated for some time, he argues, and Queen Alicent and her party, the so-called Greens, had taken care to instruct all of Viserys' guards and servants in what to do when the day came. The Dwarf Mushroom suggests a more sinister scenario, whereby Queen Alicent hurried King Viserys on his way with a pinch of poison in his Hippocras. It must be noted that Mushroom was not in King's Landing the night the King died, but rather on Dragonstone, in service with Princess Rhaenyra. Queen Alicent went at once to the King's bedchamber, accompanied by Sir Christian Cole, Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. Once they had confirmed that Viserys was dead, her grace ordered his room sealed and placed under guard. The serving man who had found the king's body was taken into custody to make certain he did not spread the tale. Sir Christian returned to White Sword Tower and sent his brothers of the king's guard to summon the members of the king's small council. It was the hour of the owl. Then, as now, the sworn brotherhood of the king's guard consisted of seven knights. Men of proven loyalty and undoubted prowess who had taken solemn oaths to devote their lives to defending the king's person and kin. Only five of the White Cloaks were in King's Landing at the time of Viserys' death. Sir Christian Cole himself, Sir Eric Cargyle, Sir Rickard Thorne, Sir Stefan Darklin, and Sir Willis Fell. Sir Eric Cargyle, twin to Sir Arik, and Sir Lawrence Marbrand, with Princess Rhaenyra on Dragonstone, remained unaware 
and uninvolved as their brothers in arms went forth into the night to rouse the members of the small council from their beds. The council convened in the Queen's apartments within Magor's Holdfast. Many accounts have come down to us of what was said and done that night. By far, the most detailed and authoritative of them is Grand Maester Munkin's The Dance of the Dragons, a true telling. Though Munkin's exhaustive history was not written until a generation later, and drew on many different sorts of materials, including Maester's chronicles, memoirs, steward's records, and interviews with 147 surviving witnesses to the great events of these times, his account of the inner workings of the court relies upon the confessions of Grand Maester Orwile as set down before his execution. Unlike Mushroom and Septon Eustace, whose versions derive from rumours, hearsay, and family legend, the Grand Maester was present at the meeting and took part in the council's deliberations and decisions. Though it must be recognised that at the time he wrote, Orwile was most anxious to show himself in a favourable light and absolve himself of any blame for what was to follow. Munkin's true telling therefore paints his predecessor in perhaps too favourable a light. Gathering in the Queen's chambers as the body of her Lord Husband grew cold above, where Queen Alicent herself, her father, Sir Otto Hightower, Hand of the King, Sir Christian Cole, Lord Commander of the King's Guard, Grand Maester Orwile, Lord Lyman Beesbury, Master of Coin, a man of eighty, Sir Tyland Lannister, Master of Ships, brother to the Lord of Castle Rock, Laris Strong, called Laris Clubfoot, Lord of Harrenhal, Master of Whisperers, and Lord Jasper Wild, called Ironrod, Master of Laws. Grand Maester Munkin dubs this gathering the Green Council in his true telling. Grand Maester Orwile opened the meeting by reviewing the customary tasks and procedures required at the death of a king. He said, Septon Eustace should be summoned to perform the last rites and pray for the king's soul. A raven must needs be sent to Dragonstone at once to inform Princess Rhaenyra of her father's passing. Mayhaps her grace the queen would care to write the passage, so as to soften these sad tidings with some words of condolence. The bells are always rung to announce the death of a king. Someone should see to that. And of course, we must begin to make our preparations for Queen Rhaenyra's coronation. Sir Otto Hightower cut him off. All this must needs wait, he declared, until the question of succession is settled. As the king's hand, he was empowered to speak with the king's voice, even to sit the Iron Throne in the king's absence. Viserys had granted him the authority to rule over the Seven Kingdoms, and until such time as our new king is crowned, that rule would continue. Until our new queen is crowned, someone said. In Grand Maester's Munkin's account, the words are all whiles spoken softly, no more than a quibble. But Mushroom and Septon Eustace insist it was Lord Beesbury who spoke up, and in a whoppish tone. King, insisted Queen Alicent. The Iron Throne by rights must pass to His Grace's eldest true-born son. The discussion that followed lasted nigh unto dawn, Grand Maester Munkin tells us. Mushroom and Septon Eustace concur. In their accounts, only Lord Beesbury spoke on behalf of Princess Rhaenyra, the ancient master of coin who had served King Viserys for the majority of his reign and his grandfather, Jaehaerys, the old king, before him reminded the council that Rhaenyra was older than her brothers and had more Targaryen blood, that the late king had chosen her as his successor, that he had repeatedly refused to alter the succession despite the pleading of Queen Alicent and her greens, that hundreds of lords and landed knights had done abeyance to the princess in 105 AC, and sworn solemn oaths to defend her rights. Grand Maester Orwile's accounts differ only in that he puts many of these arguments into his own mouth rather than Beesbury's, but subsequent events suggest that was not so, as we shall see. But these words fell on ears made of stone. Sir Tylan pointed out that many of the lords who had sworn to defend the succession of Princess Rhaenyra were long dead. It has been 24 years, he said. I myself swore no such oath. I was a child at the time. Ironrod, the Master of Laws, cited the Great Council of 101 and the Old King's choice of Balon rather than Rhaenys in 92, then discoursed at length about Aegon the Conqueror and his sisters, and the hallowed Andal tradition, 
wherein the rights of a true-born son always came before the rights of a mere daughter. So Otto reminded them that Rhaenyra's husband was none other than Prince Daemon, and we all know that one's nature. Make no mistake, should Rhaenyra ever sit the Iron Throne, it will be Lord Fleabottom who rules us, a king consort as cruel and unforgiving as Maegor ever was. My own head will be the first cut off, I do not doubt, but your queen, my daughter, will soon follow. Queen Alicent echoed him, Nor will they spare my children, she declared. Aegon and his brothers are the king's true-born sons, with a better claim to the throne than her brood of bastards. Daemon will find some pretext to put them all to death, even Helena and her little ones. One of these strongs put out Aemon's eyes, never forget. He was a boy, eh? But the boy is the father to the man, and bastards are monstrous by nature. Sir Christian Cole spoke up. Should the princess reign, he reminded them, Jacaris Valerion would rule after her. Seven save this realm if we seat a bastard on the Iron Throne. He spoke of Rhaenyra's wanton ways and the infamy of her husband. They will turn the Red Keep into a brothel. No man's daughter will be safe, nor any man's wife. Even the boys. We know what Laenor was. It is not recorded that Laris Strong spoke a word during this debate, but that was not unusual. Though glib of tongue when need be, the master of whisperers hoarded his words, like a miser hoarding coins, preferred to listening rather than talk. If we do this, Grand Maester Orwile cautioned the council, according to the true telling, it must surely lead to war. The princess will not meekly stand aside, and she has dragons, and friends, Lord Beesbury declared, men of honour who will not forget the vows they swore to her and her father. I am an old man but not so old that I will sit here meekly whilst the likes of you plot to steal her crown. And, so saying, he rose to go. As to what happens next, our sources differ. Grand Maester Orwile tells us that Lord Beesbury was sieged at the door by the command of Sir Otto Hightower and escorted to the dungeons. Confined to a black cell, he would perish of a chill whilst awaiting trial. Septon Eustace tells us elsewise. In his account, Sir Christian Cole forced Lord Beesbury back into his seat and opened his throat with a dagger. Mushroom charges Sir Christian with his lordship's death as well. But in his version, Cole grasped the old man by the back of his collar and flung him out a window, to die impaled upon the iron spikes in the dry moat below. All three chronicles agree on one particular. The first bloodshed in the Dance of the Dragons belonged to Lord Lyman Beesbury, Master of Coin, and Lord Treasurer of the Seven Kingdoms. No further dissent was heard after the death of Lord Beesbury. The rest of the night was spent making plans for the new king's coronation. It must be done quickly, all agreed, and drawing up lists of possible allies and potential enemies, should Princess Rhaenyra refuse to accept Queen Aegon's ascension. With the princess in confinement on Dragonstone, about to give birth, Queen Alicent's greens enjoyed an advantage. The longer Rhaenyra remained ignorant of the king's death, the slower she would be to move. Mayhaps the whore will die in childbirth, Queen Alicent is reported to have said, according to Mushroom. No ravens flew that night, no bells rang. Those servants who knew of the king's passing were sent to the dungeons. Sir Christian Cole was given the task of taking into custody such blacks as remained at court. These lords and knights who might be inclined to favour Princess Rhaenyra. Do them no violence, unless they resist, Sir Otto Hightower commanded. Such men as bend the knee and swear fealty to King Aegon shall suffer no harm at our hands. And those who will not, asked Grand Maester Orwile, are traitors, said Ironrod, and must die a traitor's death. Lord Laris Strong, Master of Whisperers, then spoke for the first and only time. Let us be the first to swear, he said. Let there be traitors here, amongst us. Drawing his dagger, the clubfoot drew it across his palm. A blood oath, he urged, to bind us all together, brothers unto death. And so each of the conspirators slashed their palms and clasped hands with one another, swearing brotherhood. Queen Alicent alone amongst them was excused from the oath, an account of her womanhood. Dawn was breaking over the city before Queen Alicent dispatched the king's guard to bring her sons Aegon and Amond to the council. Prince Darion, the youngest and gentlest of her children, was in Old Town, serving as Lord Hightower's squire. One-eyed Prince Amond, 19, was found in the armory, donning plate and mail for his morning practice in the castle yard. 
Is Aegon king? He asked Sir Willis Fell. Or must we kneel and kiss the old whore's cunny? Princess Helena was breaking her fast with her children when the king's guard came to her. But when asked the whereabouts of Prince Aegon, her brother and husband, she said only, he is not in my bed, you may be sure. Feel free to search beneath the blankets. Prince Aegon was at his revels, Munkin says in his true telling, vaguely. The testimony of Mushroom claims Sir Christian found the young king to be drunk and naked in a flea bottom rat pit, where two gutter snipes with filled teeth were biting and tearing at each other for his amusement, whilst a girl who could not have been more than 12 pleasured his member with her mouth. Let us put that ugly picture down to Mushroom being Mushroom, however, and consider instead the words of Septon Eustace. Though the good Septon admits Prince Aegon was with a paramour when he was found, he insists the girl was the daughter of a wealthy trader, and well cared for besides. Moreover, the prince at first refused to be part of his mother's plans. My sister is the heir, not me, he says in Eustace's account. What sort of brother steals his sister's birthright? Only when Sir Christian convinced him that the princess must surely execute him and his brothers should she don the crown, did Aegon waver. Whilst any true-born Targaryen yet lives, no strong can ever hope to sit the Iron Throne, Cole said. Rhaenyra has no choice but to take your heads if she wishes her bastards to rule after her. It was this, and only this, that persuaded Aegon to accept the crown that the small council was offering him, insists our gentle Septon. Whilst the Knights of the King's Guard were seeking after Queen Alicent's sons, other messengers summoned the commander of the city watch and his captains. There were seven, each commanding one of the city gates, to the Red Keep. Five were judged sympathetic to Prince Aegon's cause when questioned. The other two, along with their commander, were deemed untrustworthy and found themselves in chains. Sir Luther Largent, the most fearsome of the Leal Five, was made the new commander of the Gold Cloaks. A bull of a man, nigh on seven feet tall. Largent was rumoured to have once killed a war horse with a single punch. Sir Otto being a prudent man, however, he took care to name his own son, Sir Gwain Hightower, the Queen's brother, as Largent's second, instructing him to keep a wary eye on Sir Luther for any signs of disloyalty. Sir Tyland Lannister was named Master of Coin in place of the late Beesbury, and acted at once to seize the royal treasury. The crown's gold was divided into four parts. One part was entrusted to the care of the Iron Bank of Bravos for safekeeping, Another sent under strong guard to Castley Rock, a third to Old Town. The remaining wealth was to be used for bribes and gifts, and to hire sell swords if needed. To take Sir Tylan's place as master of ships, Sir Otto looked to the Iron Islands, dispatching a raven to Dalton Greyjoy, the Red Kraken, the daring and bloodthirsty 16-year-old Lord Reaper of Pike, offering him the admiralty and a seat on the council for his allegiance. A day passed, then another. Neither Septons nor Silent Sisters were summoned to the bedchamber where King Viserys lay, swollen and rotting. No bells rang. Ravens flew, but not to Dragonstone. They went instead to Old Town, to Castley Rock, to Riverrun, to Highgarden, and to many other lords and knights whom Queen Alicent had cause to think might be sympathetic to her son. The annals of the Great Council of 101 were brought forth and examined, and note was made of which lords had spoken for Viserys, and which for Rhaenys, Lena, or Lenore. The lords assembled had favoured the male claimant over the female by twenty to one, but there had been dissenters, and those same houses were most like to lead Princess Rhaenyra their support, should it come to war. The princess would have the sea snake and his fleets, Sir Otto judged, and like as not, the other lords of the eastern shores as well. Lords bar Amon, Macy, Keltigar, and Crab most like, perhaps even the even star of Tarth. All were lesser powers, save for the Valyrians. The Northmen were a greater concern. Winterfell had spoken for Rhaenys at Harrenhal, as had Lord Stark's Bannerman, Dustin of Barrowtown, and Manderley of White Harbour. Nor could House Arryn be relied upon, for the Eyrie was presently ruled by a woman, Lady Jean, the Maiden of the Vale whose own rights might be called into question should Princess Rhaenyra be put aside. The greatest danger was deemed to be Storm's End, for House Baratheon had always been staunch in support of the claims of Princess Rhaenys and her children. 
Though old Lord Bormund had died, his son Boris was even more belligerent than his father, and the lesser Storm Lords would surely follow wherever he led. Then we must see that he leads them to our king, Queen Alicent declared, whereupon she sent her second son. Thus it was not a raven who took flight for Storm's End that day, but Vega, oldest and largest of the dragons of Westeros. On her back rode Prince Aemon Targaryen, with a sapphire in the place of his missing eye. Your purpose is to win the hand of one of Lord Baratheon's daughters, his grandsire Sir Otto told him before he flew. Any of the four will do. Woo her and wed her, and Lord Boris will deliver the Stormlands for your brother. Fail? I will not fail, Prince Aemon blustered. Aegon will have Storm's End, and I will have this girl. By the time Prince Aemon took his leave, the stink from the dead king's bedchamber had wafted all through Mager's holdfast, and many wild tales and rumours were spreading through the court and castle. The dungeons under the Red Keep had swallowed up so many men suspected of disloyalty that even the High Septon had begun to wonder at these disappearances, and sent word from the Starry Sept of Old Town asking after some of the missing. Sir Otto Hightower, as methodical a man as ever served his hand, wanted more time to make preparations, but Queen Alicent knew they could delay no longer. Prince Aegon had grown weary of secrecy. Am I a king or no? he demanded of his mother. If I am a king, then crown me. The bells began to ring on the tenth day of the third moon of 129 AC, tolling the end of a reign. Grand Maester Orwile was at last allowed to send forth his ravens, and the blackbirds took to the air by the hundreds, spreading the word of Aegon's ascension to every far corner of the realm. The Silent Sisters were sent for, to prepare the corpse for burning, and riders went forth on pale horses to spread the word to the people of King's Landing, crying, King Viserys is dead! Long live King Aegon! Hearing the cries, Munkin writes, some wept whilst others cheered, but most of the small folk stared in silence, confused and wary, and now and again a voice cried out, Long live our queen! Meanwhile, hurried preparations were made for the coronation. The dragon pit was chosen as the site. Under its mighty dome were stone benches sufficient to seat 80,000, and the pit's thick walls, strong roof, and towering bronze doors made it defensible, should traitors attempt to disrupt the ceremony. On the appointed day, Sir Christian Cole placed the iron and ruby crown of Aegon the Conqueror upon the brow of the eldest son of King Viserys and Queen Alicent, proclaiming him Aegon of House Targaryen, second of his name, King of the Andals, the Rhoynar, and the First Men, Lord of the Seven Kingdoms and Protector of the Realm. His mother, Queen Alicent, beloved of the small folk, placed her own crown upon the head of her daughter, Helena. Aegon's wife and sister. After kissing her cheeks, the mother knelt before the daughter, bowed her head and said, My queen. How many came to see the crowning remains a matter of dispute. Grand Maester Munkin, drawing upon Orwile, tells us that more than a hundred thousand small folk jammed into the dragon pit, their cheers so loud they shook the very walls, whilst Mushroom says the stone benches were half filled. With the High Septon in Old Town, too old and frail to journey to King's Landing, it fell to Septon Eustace to anoint King Aegon's brow with holy oils, and bless him in the seven names of God. A few of those in attendance, with sharper eyes than most, might have noticed that there were but four white cloaks in attendance on the new king. Not five as heretofore. Aegon II had suffered his first defections the night before, when Sir Stephen Darkin of the Kingsguard had slipped from the city with his squire, two stewards, and four guardsmen. Under the cover of darkness, they made their way out a post and gate to where a fisherman's skiff awaited to take them to Dragonstone. They brought with them a stolen crown, a band of yellow gold ornamented with seven gems of different colours. This was the crown King Viserys had worn, and the old King Jaehaerys before him. When Prince Aegon had decided to wear the iron and ruby crown of his namesake, the Conqueror, Queen Alicent had ordered Viserys crown locked away, but the steward entrusted with the task had made off with it instead. After the coronation, the remaining Kingsguard escorted Aegon to his mount, a splendid creature with gleaming golden scales and pale pink wing membranes. Sunfire was the name given this dragon of the Golden Dawn. Munkin tells us the king flew thrice around the city before landing inside the walls of the Red Keep. 
So Eric Cargyle led his grace into the torch-lit throne room, where Aegon II mounted the steps of the Iron Throne before a thousand lords and knights. Shouts rang through the hall. So, it seems as though the Maesters are focusing the blame for the Dance of the Dragons entirely on House Hightower. But, as we'll see in episode 10 of House of the Dragon, they helped escalate the conflict between the Blacks and the Greens, while betraying themselves as innocent bystanders to the violence and bloodshed that they might have had a hand in orchestrating. But we'll see if the show adapts this. Anyway, this was another great episode of House of the Dragon, and we'll continue to make more videos on the differences between book and show. In the meantime, check out our playlists on every chapter of A Game of Thrones and A Feast for Dragons Explained. Also, when you get the chance, try out Fantasy Flight's A Game of Thrones board game, Digital Edition.